All right, welcome to another edition of the Deals for Dentists podcast. And today we're joined by Dr. Paul Etchison, who's zooming in from the suburbs of Chicago. Is that right? That's right. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for joining me. Um, I've been actually wanted to uh, talk to you for a while because I read your book um, and I actually passed that along to uh, some of my staff members. So awesome. Um, yeah, no, it was, uh, it was an excellent read. Um, Dr. Dr. Etchison is the author of Dental Practice Hero, From Ordinary Practice to Extraordinary Experience. He's also a speaker and has his own podcast, the Dental Practice Heroes podcast, and he's a practicing dentist, so a lot going on there. Yeah. Um, so thanks for joining us. Yeah, happy to be here. So I just wanted to start with your dental journey. Like, How did you decide to become a dentist? Where did you go to dental school? Let's start there. Yeah, you know, it's kind of a weird story because I was an advertising major and um, my my stepdad at the time had this really great like internship at Leo Burnett in Chicago that somebody he knew that worked there was getting for me. And then unfortunately, the person that he knew ended up having a stroke going on disability. I didn't get the internship. And then it kind of led me to really reevaluate whether I even wanted to do that at all. So um, as I reevaluated that, I decided it wasn't really for me. And then started, you know, you start Googling things like best jobs and, you know, dentist pops up there pretty high. And I just decided to go with that. I mean, it was like, okay, it's, you could be a doctor, you could be a business owner, you don't have to work on the weekends, sometimes work four days a week. And the income looks good. And if I screw something up, it's just a tooth. It's not someone's life. So it just, um, I just tried it. And then when I got out of it, or like once I got into it, I decided that, I mean, I, I realized that I really liked it. So uh, I really liked the working with the hands part, but that was, had nothing to do with me deciding to do it. It was just kind of serendipitous that I just, let's try this and let's go for it. And we just did it. So. And where'd you go to dental school? Uh, I went to UIC in Chicago. So I went to UIC in Chicago. I graduated in 2009, um, did an associateship for about two and a half years. And then I opened up my own practice, which is my current practice in 2012. And that's Nelson Ridge Family Dental. That's in New Lenox, which is um, maybe like 40 miles south of Chicago. And it's it's a suburb, but it's probably like the last Chicago suburb before it turns into like farmland. So I'm about as far as Chicago, far from Chicago as you can be and still be in a suburb. Um, But yeah, we've been open since 2012, going on uh, nine years this April. So it's been good. Oh, that's awesome. And now, so your associating gig, So that was a two year. um, Was that in one practice? Did you associate in one single practice or multiple practices? So that was with a smaller group, like a 12 office group. And I worked out of two offices. So I did that for about two years. And then I started opening up my new practice or or my startup. And then I I hung on there for maybe, I want to say three months after my office owns or opened. So I, I think I was there about three years total. Uh, now, do you think that was a good amount of time? Do you think you were ready oh, yeah. by then to? to yeah, you know? I, mean, I think that was perfect amount of time. I think it was just enough time. And that, that was the thing. Like I started looking at opening up my own office and buying different offices. Is like when you get out of school, you kind of don't know what you don't know. And then you, you get work on your speed. But I eventually got to a point where I was like, okay, I'm pretty comfortable seeing everybody I'm seeing now. I'm not asking too many questions. I mean, still always ask questions, but um not, nothing like you're just trying to get better. It's not like you're like you get these cases where you just don't know what the heck to do anymore. So it was like, um, I just got to the point where I was like, okay, I can comfortably see people. I can do I'm comfortable with most of my procedures, my procedural mix. I mean, I look back now, that was almost, you know, nine years ago. I, I, I feel like I didn't know anything, but at the time, you know how it is. Like you, you really feel like, you know, everything there is to know. And then you, as, as we mature as dentists, we, we realize that you just keep getting better every year. And it's, it's just one of those things you can really never perfect, it seems. Oh, yeah, it's it, it is so true. I actually, personally, I was the opposite. I took I, way too long to, to buy into the practice that I'm in. I associated mm-hmm. for 10 years, which oh, wow. I, okay. yeah, it was a was a long process. Um, you know, I just I just got I got comfortable, you know, I, yeah. I got comfortable in the whole um, just, you know, doing your thing and going home and not having to deal with the staff and um, I miss all that. the HR. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do so miss that. that. But you yeah. know what it was too, is I, I was trying to do training things with the front desk. I wanted to do the scheduling different. I wanted to do a lot of things different than the way they did it. And it, it just wasn't, it wasn't right for me. I wasn't, uh, yeah. So now, it, it just did, wasn't like, I, I wasn't a good associate. I needed to be, do my own thing. Was this a, um, 
uh, did you end up buying someone out or did you start a scratch office scratch yeah i, yep. I went and took scott luna's breakaway practice seminars down in san antonio and just on the recommendation of a, a colleague and i was just like yeah okay i'll go check it out and i like i remember the first day i was in the hotel just telling my wife i'm like dude we're, we're just gonna open a practice she's like you're crazy yeah. you can't just open with no patients i'm like we're doing it we're gonna yeah. do a startup so it went really well i mean we were, we were busy out of the gate uh yeah. Good location, good marketing, solid growth ever since we opened. So it's it's, it's been a really uh, good thing so that I'm glad that we did it. Did you still associate and kind of uh, do like a 50-50 thing until you built up your practice? Right. Well, I did it for like about two, three months. And it was, it was just like we were busy enough. I, I want to say our first month we did maybe 40K and then and then their second month, maybe right a little bit around 45 and then 50 or third month. And it was comfortable enough where I'm like, this can work, but I would rather sit at the practice without patients than continue to see yeah. patients at my associateship. And the thing was too, man, I was excited about it. I was excited about the business and, you know, you got this new shiny thing and then you got this other old office that you're working at that just you've been there for three years and you're ready for something new. So I think I was just creating excuses to get out of there, but it allowed me to focus on my team and growing it. And we were, we were busy. We were seeing a lot of new patients. So it, it was time. I didn't feel like I had to hold on to that associateship very long. Now, did you do all your own hygiene or did you hire a staff right away? Right. So my wife is a hygienist. So she started like, I did my own hygiene for maybe two weeks. Mm -hmm. and, and I hated it, man. I, I don't ever want to do that again. I, I can't, you hear about these, these dentists and they're doing their own hygiene. I think it's just crazy. Like I would, I'd go crazy, but uh, yeah, it was easy. It was easy for me to hire a hygienist because I mean, she was my wife and I didn't have to pay her. So now, so you just, you just kind of jumped right in. How, how did you get so many new patients right off the bat? You know, when we started, it was, it was a lot of drive-by. We were probably seeing 40 new patients a month that just said they drove by and they saw like mm -hmm. our mailer and stuff like that. But we were really focused on the Google reviews early. And this was like 2012. And this was before like anyone was really thinking this was very important. So we were like out ahead of everybody in our area along with um, a decent website. I mean, I look at back at my first website and I think it's horrible, but it was mm -hmm. good at the time. And we had a good website. We had a good marketing message as far, as far as like that we had a bunch of five-star reviews and people were saying good things about us. But it, the also thing was we were open late, man. We were open until nine o'clock on Mondays and eight o'clock mm -hmm. on Wednesdays. And I think we were open until seven on Wednesdays actually, but we were open late and that was very easy to market. And when I think that is the lowest, lowest hanging fruit if you want yeah. more new patients is just stay open late. I mean, mm -hmm. phone skills too. You got to work on, on the people converting over phone, but um I think a lot of practice owners really shy away from those late nights and you really only have to do one or two a week. And mm -hmm. those people that need that availability, they will also need to come back and, and schedule the rest of their families and stuff like that. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a no brainer. I mean, we're, we're open Saturdays. I've worked Saturdays for years and um, uh, we get so many new patients that, you know, just offices just aren't open on Saturdays. We're like right. the only one in the area. So, um, and then eventually those patients, you know, they, they start to schedule during the week and, um, but we get so many new patients from Saturdays. Um, so did, um, did breakaway, did that get you ready? Um, uh, did you also take some other CE courses and, and seminars before you open your practice? Um, I took or productive dentist Academy was another big one, just practice mm -hmm. management, but, um, no, not really just, you know, you just kind of do it and it, it comes at you and you handle everything as it comes. And, and then you just, uh, deal with it as it comes. It's, it's a, it's a big learning experience, you know, but oh yeah, you figure it out. And, and I mean, there's so many resources now you've got the, the internet, you got all these Facebook groups, you got dental town. I mean, there's so many avenues where you can ask questions and stuff. That's true. There's so much peer engagement out there. You, you, there's so many places you can go where um, when I, so I graduated in Oh two and then I did a two year residency in Oh four and there was mm -hmm. nothing out there back then. Yeah. Um, Right. So it was, it was totally different. So, so actually I heard your podcast this morning and you had some big news. Um, so you, you basically, you partnered up with MB2. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We partnered with MB2 on the 11th. I mean, we're recording this on the 21st, so 10 days ago. So mm -hmm. a relatively new partnership, but yeah, I decided to bring out a partner. Uh, I guess just to tell the listeners, like to give an idea where my office was. I mean, we went from a five op, we were really busy at capacity. We, we doubled our size to an 11 op office. 
I have two associates, full-time associates. I have a periodontist that comes in every other week for a full day. And, um, and I have 30, well, now I have 37 team members. So I, I have a very large team. So part of my decision to partner with them was, I mean, most of it was like lifestyle decision. It was like, this is what I want the next chapter of my life to be like, but it was like, we could really benefit from the admin services that they provide and stuff. So that was the, a big decision. It was hard, man. And, and I told, I went back and forth on it for good, man, five, six months. I mean, probably since, I don't even know, maybe almost a year. It, it, it seems like I've been going back and forth on this for a long time. But it's something I finally just committed to and said, hey, we're doing it. And I, I'm happy about the partnership. I think it's going to work out really well for us. And um, it, it's going to allow me to move into the next chapter of my life, which I don't know what's going to be. You know, it might be opening additional offices. But I, I know I really like managing people. I really like the training aspect of it. But I can't say that, um, not that I hate the, the clinical, but I really do. Uh, I, I like working with my people more than working <laughs> with, with patients. Now, so you're up to, you said 37 team members. Yeah. I mean, so that's some monster growth. So you went from five to 11 ops. Yeah. And did you buy a new building or did you just expand? So we're in a strip mall and there was a tanning bed next to me and they closed down. So we went from 2,000 to 4,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And so we, we were able to build out another six operatories out of that. How was that, that jump? I mean, that's a major jump. You doubled the size of your, your yeah. practice. We went from 15, I want to say we had 15 people back then. I think we hired maybe like eight or nine new people to do that. And it was crowded, man. Cause we were training everybody the month or month and maybe six weeks before we opened up the new side. So we had all these people in a tiny five op office. Um, it's a different animal. It's, the communication is different. The you get a lot of this like, hey, why are you doing it that way? Well, I don't know. That's how I always did it. Well, we said we're not doing it like that anyway. Well, I, yeah, I brought this up in the meeting and they'd be like, well, I, I didn't hear about it. And you're like, well, I told everybody. They're like, well, I don't know. Like, you just get these communication breakdowns as a whole nother level of establishing leaders and, and not a bureaucracy in your practice, but you need some level, some hierarchy of just communication and just scheduling the communication, scheduling the meetings, which we did before, but it just means a whole nother thing right now. You know, we, we, you got to talk to your team. You got to sit there and sit down and figure things out. And it's, uh, if you're not putting it on the schedule, it just doesn't happen. So do you have, I mean, how, how do you handle all that, that staff? Do you have um, like an assistant leader, a hygiene leader, uh, yeah. like each department has its own leads? Yeah. So the big thing for me is, yeah, I have a hygiene lead. I have an assistant lead and I have a front desk lead. And I also have my office manager mm -hmm. and an insurance coordinator. So everyone, those are the, the leads in my group. We meet um, the lead meetings we do uh, once every other week. And we meet as a team once a month. I meet with my hygiene team personally once a month. And I meet with my front desk. You know, it's kind of an as needed thing. thing. Like I would say like for the past three months, we've probably met for an hour thing, maybe six different times, you know? And then now I don't think we've met for almost three weeks now. now it, and, I, and I apologize about the noise, Eric. I have like probably six construction people doing some like uh, mill work in my house right now. I don't know oh, if no it's picking up on the microphone or not. I, I haven't I haven't heard anything. So okay, no good. Um, and it's these cool Aftershock headphones I have. That yeah, are like, nice. They were a game changer for me. Really, that's um, cool. So, um, uh, with, with that kind of, um, system, that hierarchy, have you noticed less of that communication breakdown? There's definitely less, but it definitely, it definitely still happens. And you just try to do your best with it. Like we have a Slack page. I don't know if the listeners are familiar with that, but Slack is an app. It's very, I guess it's kind of Facebook like, but it's, it's like a private app that you can have for your organization where you create channels and there's a lot of communication that happens in there. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, we have these meetings, we have a, a two hour meeting once a month with the whole team. And then we'll do like about 20 minutes of that as everybody. And then we break into departments and then we come back and we talk within departments. And it, it's one of those things like when you're about like maybe 12 to 15 people or less, you can, um, you can have these big meetings and everyone can talk things out. But once you get like past 15 people, it's, it gets really hard to have a productive meeting with that many people contributing and it's like, it seems like over and over, you just keep getting in the weeds about things. You're like, what are we even talking about anymore? So yes, there's, of course, there's still breakdowns, but 
we having a large team is about creating systems and saying this is how we do it training your people on the way that we do it and giving people the leeway to use their own brains and make their own decisions at the same time but it's it's a challenge and that's the biggest challenge of it but it's it's a fun challenge and and the more energy you put into it the more rewards you get um you know just doing a little tweak with a big practice like mine can make a big difference on the bottom line and in the numbers and everything so uh, I mean, just for instance, just doing like some phone training, you know, that'll make a huge difference in our new patient numbers. And it's, it's a much more magnified effect um, in my practice because it's large versus a smaller practice, but it's, that's the stuff I enjoy. That's the fun stuff is the training, the working with the team, the communication. But yeah, I, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a challenge. Now, did you ever think about opening a second you know, facility or totally sec- well, separate I, practice? I think about that often. I do. Yeah. And I just, I'm not there yet. I think that's something that will, that's just going to happen in my future. I just don't think that I'm ready for it. And I don't think I have the time for it, to be honest. And the fact of the matter is, is that, uh, I mean, with the numbers that we're doing right now, it's, it's almost like I have multiple practices. It's just all in one location. So it's, I, I can't, I can't picture myself doing it anytime soon, but who knows, you know, it's, at some point I'm probably going to stop seeing patients and maybe that'll be what's what I enjoy. And maybe it won't be, you know, I I haven't figured it out yet, but I haven't committed to one or the other yet. So did you start thinking about this during the actual quarantine where you said, you know, maybe partnering or selling your practice? um, That is that when it started? You know, I I was thinking about it a little bit before that. I mean, it's something you always think about. You're like, when is, when is my exit? When am I going to get out of this? And, and I didn't partner up with MB2 to exit by any means, but it's something you always think about. And then I just, yeah, being home, man, it was a lot of people said they couldn't stand it and they wanted their kids to go back to school and they, they wanted something to do and they were bored, man. I I loved every moment of it. And I, I couldn't believe I would have told you before the practice or before the practice shut down that, man, I don't do anything there. I, I delegate everything. It's very low stress. And then it went away and I got to see, how stressful it really was when it was gone. I was like, Oh my gosh, like, you know, it is really stressful. So I I think that did play a factor in it. It gave me a taste of what would life be like without the practice. And it kind of helped me realize that even though I've been very delegated and my team drives the majority of my practice, um, that it was mentally occupying a, a big emotional space in my mind. And it was, um, yeah, I just, it, it, it played a huge part in it. I just, when I went back, I said, I'm going to do things differently. And then we, we opened back up in June. And as time progressed, I, I set some boundaries with my team. I said they couldn't call me on certain days. They, um, I started deflecting more of the putting out the fires. And it eventually just like, it just was the logical progression. I said, you know what, this is time. I, I need a partner. I need some help on the back end. And, you know, the good part is you take some equity out and you get some chips yep. off the table. I less my lessen my risk. And, you know, if we have another shutdown, do I care? Yeah, of course I care. You know, I still I'm still an owner in the practice, but I, I don't care as much as I would when I was 100 percent owner. Yeah. So that was a really good point you said about mentally occupying the space in your mind, because um, one of the silver linings of the quarantine was that, you know, I personally I couldn't just sit there and do nothing and, and you know, for three months while we were shut down, you know, I was, I had to do something. I wasn't just going to, you know, sit there and get fat, no. um, which, which I did anyway. So I might as well <laughs> so be so productive. <laughs> so, um, you know, so I, I started a website um, podcast. I learned how to develop a website. You know, I said, I have to do something. And it was such a great distraction from the office. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that turned into, you know, some blogging, um, developing the podcast. Now I'm writing a book. Um, so all these things have really helped me reduce my stress from the office, because if I was only thinking office, 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 I think, you know, the, the quarantine would have, would have driven me, you know, into, you know, deep burnout. Um, but I started to create these other businesses and endeavors, and it was really such a great distraction. Um, because you, you also personally, you have a podcast, you Mm -hmm. have, um, coaching and consulting businesses. Um, you wrote a book. Um, so do do you find that that is such a great stress relief from the, the, the stresses of the clinical uh, aspect of the profession? I mean, it's one of those things, man. I mean, you you have patients that are upset with you and you've a patient that had unrealistic expectations 
and you have a patient complaining about something, you've got a team member complaining about something, uh, there's, there's, there's drama going on at the practice between people. N- none of these, I don't have any things like that in my podcast, in my uh, dental business mentor, which is my, my teaching site. I don't have any of that with my coaching or consulting. Um, I don't have that being on podcasts such as yours. I mean, I'm not putting out any fires with you and I today. And I have like, you know, it's not like we're going to get in an argument. So it's like, the, like you said, like the more, the more I, I did these side projects is I think that was, I mean, that was kind of a turning point for me that I realized, man, I really like the content creation. I really like creating. I like the, I just like the, the, the whole possibility of it. Like, like today I woke up. I have a podcast with you. I have a coaching call after this and then I have nothing, but, but I'm not going to do nothing. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to work on some other things. I'm going to work on um, some ideas for like my, my solo podcast next year. Uh, I have to wrap up some weird things financially with like a 401k. Like I have things to do that, but they're, they're not, um, they're not stressful. They're things that I choose to do and that I would do if I didn't have to do anyway, I think. So yeah, once I started doing all these side things, I think is when I started kind of saying, you know what, man, t- taking care of patients is pretty stressful. Yeah. And I think that's what started that my steady decline of clinical, like for instance, I was four days a week and then I was three days a week when I brought on my associate. Uh, when we expanded our practice, I went down to two days a week and then coming up in February, I'm going back to one and a half days a week. In, in all of these weeks, I'm taking off one week a month. So these are only three weeks out of the each month that I'm doing this. And that just seems to be the logical progression that I'm eventually going to end up being non-clinical. But yeah, I mean, just like you, man, I was busy over quarantine. I wasn't just, you know, doing puzzles and watching TV. And, and, and it's funny you mentioned, I, everyone says like, man, if I could work out all day, I'd be so skinny. And then you actually had like the chance to work out all day. And then I was, I was like, man, I put on probably 20 pounds in the quarantine, you know? It's just well, like, I, you know, I have little kids, so there's always French fries and diamond yeah, nuggets around and you I know. Know, they just smell so good and they're sitting there and Can't so, know? yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> by the time this, this airs, it, it will probably be into 2021. Okay. Um, so, I mean, 2020 was such a crazy year. Yeah. Um, you know, it, I mean, looking back on it, there's so many things that happened and it was a great time. Um, you know, there were some silver linings that, that I really took out of it. Like I could reset my office. Um, we had the time to um, pick up a digital scanner. Um, so we don't lo- we no longer take PVS impressions. Um, we, we fixed some systems. Um, so there was um, um, some things that we were able to kind of reset. Also, you know, I live and work in the same town so I can go to the grocery store in a mask and not everyone recognizes me anymore immediately. So <laughs> that, that is a plus. You know, no one knows if I have bad breath or not. So there's some, there are some silver linings. Don't have to shave. Yeah. You know, you can, anything goes, you know, you you don't have to shave. Um, So although, um, you know, you do have to put things in perspective because a friend of mine, he's in California and he had, he has multiple offices Mm -hmm. and one of his practices was um, looted during some of the rioting. Another practice, um, uh, I think, went up in flames in California during the, uh, oh, the fires, gosh. and he's dealing with the pandemic. So, you know, to put it in perspective, I mean, yeah, my office is probably down 25%, but it could have been a lot worse. I mean, yeah. you know, I just think, you know, that it's, we'll be fine. You know, we're still up and running. We're getting great reviews. Um, all the patients and staff feel safe. So, um, I mean, but just what a, what a crazy year. Well, I mean, we're um, lucky to be in the industry we're in because, I mean, think of all these, I mean, restaurants are getting crushed, man. I, at least we can still operate. And that if, I mean, they're, they're doing all the shutdowns everywhere again and, and dentists aren't getting shut down this time. So I'm, I'm very thankful for the industry, the industry that we're in. Yeah. I, you know, if it does, if there is another shutdown, I still think we'll be fine. Um, so tell me about your, your partnering with MB2. Mm-hmm. What was that whole process like? How did you end up choosing them? Was there negotiating that went, in, went into it? Yeah, well, there wasn't a lot of negotiation because they were pretty much like, this is what we offer for a practice of your size EBITDA. But um, what was it, man? I, so I, I talked to them and then I eventually hired a broker, you know, and a broker shot me around to some different ones. I got pretty far with two other groups. Um, the reason I chose MB2 is that the other two groups, I mean, what everyone's fear about corporate is like that someone's going to come into your practice and tell you what to do, give you some quotas and goals. And it's going to be very, it's going to be more about the profits than about the patients and the team. And, and that's what everyone's fear is, you know, 
and I, and I got to say with the two other groups, other than MB2, I talked to, I really kind of felt like that was a very strong possibility as they were saying that, you know, once we implement our systems in your office, once when you, so we start getting our regional uh, director that used to be, they were, this person's an office manager for this many years and they're going to come teach you or your and your team how to do this. And, and I don't want that, you know, my, my office is doing good. So MB2's thing is that they're dentist driven, that the dentist, the owner dentist still maintains autonomy and decisions on everything. And they will provide the back end, kind of behind the scenes admin support. Mm -hmm. And for an office my size, that was really uh, beneficial for us. And it's um, like the payroll and, and all the credentialing and all the compliance stuff. Now, that, I wasn't personally doing that myself. That was my office manager's role. But our, our partnership has probably saved my office manager. I mean, she's probably going to save 10, 12 hours a week now. Mm -hmm. And that gives her more time to train the team and work on things like that. So, um, my, but my partnership, it, it consisted of me shopping these three deals, finding out that what they were, the offerings I was getting from all three of them were fairly the similar, they were fairly, fairly the same as far as uh, numbers and, and cash and stuff, but it just didn't feel, it, it felt, it didn't feel right with the other two groups and which is why I didn't end up going with them. And then I actually said no to the other two groups. And then I hadn't talked to MB2 for a good probably four or five months. And I didn't even think I was going to do it. And then after I said, thought about it, I'm like, man, I'm going to talk to them one more time. And then once I got to like meet the, you know, their C-suite, all the, all those guys and, and, and girls and met them and learned more about their culture. I was just like, dude, this is, this is the right thing for me, but it was hard, man. It's, this is my baby. This is the thing I've been growing for the past nine years. You're scared to sell your moneymaker. You know, it's a really profitable practice and it's doing really well. So why would I ever sell it? But for me, it was more about what am I going to be doing in the next five, 10 years? And do I want the freedom to do that? So if I want to stick around with this practice three years from now, by all means, I will. And if I want to cut down my hours three years from now or now, which I, I mean, I'm a day and a half a week, I can, I'm still like, I still in control. So it's, it just was better for me from a flexibility standpoint and a freedom standpoint that maybe three years from now, I don't even want to be there at all. Who knows? I don't know what it's going to feel like, but so far in our little short partnership that we've had, just, you know, it hasn't even been a month yet. Um, it feels different. It feels good. It feels like uh, the, the emotional attachment I have to every little thing that happens there is much less now than it was a month ago. And, and I think that was what I wanted this partnership to do for me, just to take some of the stress away and the anxiety and the worry. And it's done that. So so far, so good. Time will tell, but I think it's going to be good. I've talked to other people that have partnered with MB2, and they've all been really happy too. So that was part of my due diligence. So I, I'm confident that my I'll have the same experience. Now, were the other groups that you spoke with, were they more hands-on with clinical systems and yes. a little more involved with that? And that wasn't yeah. your, you know, your cup of tea? Yeah, they, they're talking about my hygienist, and, and they're going to come in here, and they got to do a lot of work in my hygiene program. And once they get their hygiene program in my office and – they introduce lasers and, and, you know, we're, we're going to do more rest in, and it's just, just kind of like, it was just almost like the things you would think that I don't want to talk crap about major chains and I won't even say names, but um, it's kind of like what you thought. That's what, mm -hmm. that's what I thought it was kind of going to be like to join a corporation. And it, it kind of seemed like it was going to be like that. And, and it's, I mean, for me with my office and I'll just, I throw out numbers there and I'm not trying to like humble brag by any means, but like we're in the four millions in collections and I can't sell my practice to an associate that they'll never get the amount of money to pay me for the value. So my only exit is with a joining a group, but um, so far, no, no regrets. And I, I'm glad I would do it. And I think if I had a smaller office, I'd still probably do it the same way because mm -hmm. I just, I see the benefit of being part of a group now. Now, do they have, uh, like different packages where if you wanted them to be a little more hands-on, you, you chose, mm -hmm. you know, MB2 because they were kind of helping you more with the back end, you know, back office stuff and mm -hmm. not the clinical. But what if you wanted them to be a little bit more clinical, clinically mm -hmm. involved? Was that an option as well? Well, so they say they, they're they there to help us on the back end and they are there to help us with whatever we want help with. So mm -hmm. if we want help with something, they will reach out to them. And I do have a, a regional uh, director that I speak to. Her name is Annette. And she will help me with whatever I want to do with my office. So I, I would say, yeah, they would support you in that. But I don't know from personal experience. I haven't had any type of support like that from them. 
Um, I think if you wanted it, they would give it to you, which is nice rather than someone shoving it down your throat and you don't want right. it, you know, yep. and, and that, that's what I think the difference is between MB2 and some other groups. Now, how about the negotiation with the percentage of ownership? Is that, mm -hmm. do they have a standard package for that? Or is that something you well, were offered? I don't know if they have, I, I'm pretty sure they do have a standard package of it. Um, though I, I didn't, I did zero negotiating with them. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a little bit during the contract, little clauses here and there, just that my, my attorney threw in just to protect me. But um, I think it's pretty standard. You know, they, 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 I think they base their offers based on EBITDA, you know, which is mm -hmm. for listeners on earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. And that's just pretty much your owner profits. So mm -hmm. they, um, they, they, they base it off that, you know, and, and if, if any of your listeners want to reach out to me, um, I'd be happy to have a conversation with them about if it's something they're thinking about. Like, I mean, I was, I was kind of stuck in limbo land for a while. And I talked to a lot of dentists that had done it. And it was helpful for me. So I just pay it forward. They can send me an email at dentalpracticeheroes at gmail.com. If anyone's listening and kind of wants to talk about that. That's, I think that's great. Yeah. I think it's, that's great that it's, you know, it's, it's working out and they're not, you know, they're allowing you to run your systems, your practice, the way that you've always done it and the way that you want to do it. And you've, you've set the tone of that practice and the culture and um, you know, why would you want someone to come in and just change everything? Yeah. Um, uh, it wouldn't be fair what, to my team. Right. It wouldn't be fair to them who, who's been with me along the journey and helped me create all these systems. I mean, they're a huge part of what we do and how we do it. So to sell them out to, you know what guys, Hey, I'm not the boss anymore. This is your new boss. So, and then, you know, that's, that's not the way I wanted to do it. I still wanted to be an owner. I still want to be the boss. Now you wrote the book dental practice here and that was back in 2017. Yeah. And I read that book phenomenal read and I gave it, you know, to my office manager, my partner, uh, my bookkeeper. And, um, it was a lot of it was about team and yeah. you're kind of checking in with the staff. Is that like, is that your thing that you you're very into, you know, the HR management and, and just keep it in touch with the staff and communication. Well, I think my big thing is, is the communication with the team. Yeah. It, that's, that's my strong suit. And, and, and again, I, I don't say this to brag, but I got 37 team members right now. We've no one has ever left my team nine years. Okay. Now we didn't always have 37 team members. But there's a reason for that, and that's because I'm asking the questions. I'm, I'm seeking and I'm soliciting the feedback from my team, like, hey, how are we doing? How are things for you? You know, And I talk to them, <clears throat> excuse me, I talk to them all the time about how things are going and what they think we should do. And I let them, I let them get creative and create things, and, and I let them screw things up, and I, and I forgive them when they do, and, and we don't make anyone feel bad at my practice. So it's just like very great growth culture, you know, foundationally grounded, and we're going to take the best care of people we possibly can so that they can tell more people about us. You know, we can help more people. That's our vision. That's our goal. But it's, it's, if you're not asking the questions, you're not taking the time to talk to your team, it becomes very difficult to, to keep people and keeping <clears throat> training new people is tough. And uh, culture is built, you know, it's, it's just like trust. It's, it's not something you just say, Hey, let's trust each other. Let's have a great culture. You're like, you got to build that. So it's, it, that's my thing is I, it's always been very open communications. I've always, I mean, I think I'm easy to talk to. My team tells me I'm easy to talk to. And I'm just very careful about how I react when they tell me things, because when they, when they share something with me or they take a risk, or they're going to tell me they screwed something up. I want to be very careful that I don't make them feel bad because I want them to tell me about it. You know, I want to know these things. And if I criticize them, if I get defensive of the, you know, they tell me I'm being a jerk, which I'm, I am a jerk sometimes, you know, I, I'm, I'm normal, I'm human. And they tell me I'm a jerk. I just have to count to three and go, you know what? Yeah. You know what? I'm really sorry. And that's another thing saying, sorry. I say, sorry all the freaking time, man. Um, if you can't recognize when you've, uh, you know, you've hurt somebody or someone's mad at you, come on. I mean, you, you just got to, you got to sometimes just say, sorry. And sometimes I'm saying sorry for things that I really don't think were my fault, but that's okay because I want the relationships in my practice to be good and I don't have to be right. I'm beyond, I'm in a, almost four years old. I'm done being right. Um, I'd rather just be happy. So. Mm -hmm. That's, that's so well put, <laughs> um, you know, having a, you know, a great culture and team is you, you want to go to work happy and you want to work with people you enjoy working with. Um, what, what's your process in hiring? How do you find mm -hmm. these um, great employees that um, do you hire on, on attitude and not on experience? Well, we're at the point where we need some experience, you know, because my practice is really busy and we've tried the 
I mean, we're hiring on attitude. I mean, don't get me wrong, but we, we've tried hiring people that are in, in other industries and it just, it tends to take a little bit more time than I think what we have or we're willing to give for as far as training. So we, we do want some experience, but um, <clears throat> usually involves us just posting an ad on Indeed. My office manager will call them. If they're sound friendly on the phone, they come in for an interview. Uh, usually that interview is while I'm at the practice, my office manager will do the interview. And if she likes this person, then I get to go meet them. If I like them, then I grab one of my other leads or just someone on my team say, Hey, go talk to this person for 30 minutes. And then uh, we have them come in and do a four hour working interview. And we've done all those steps are the result of two bad hires that we made. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I, so I said, no, like no one's ever left my team. We, we fired two people within three weeks of them starting and we didn't do the working interview. It was just me and my office manager doing the interview. And right on their first day when they started, we just knew it wasn't going to work. Mm-hmm. And we tried and we pushed for three weeks until we finally said, okay, you know what? We are giving the benefit of the doubt here. They weren't the right person for the job. And um, so now we do it that way. But like, let me say this too. We found great people. I've got 37 all-stars. Like, Literally, like I'm telling you all stars, but think about how your good your team would be if no one ever left. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And you only ca- or you kept the people that you wanted to keep and you just replaced them with other people like them. I mean, that's the thing is like, it's been difficult for me to hire because we're growing and sometimes it's really hard to find people, but it's so much easier to keep that going when I'm not replacing seats. Like if I had to replace people and grow, man, I, I don't think I could find enough people to do it because every time we go and put an ad out, someone always just squeaks in right under the radar, like right at the end. And they're like, we're like, dude, that's the person that is that that person's joining our team. And I can't tell you how many times we've interviewed for positions. We're just like, dude, where are all the good applicants? So yeah. for me, it's about, I want to hire people I enjoy talking to and if I enjoy talking to them. So will the patients and so will my team. And that's about it. You got to be outgoing. You got to be enthusiastic. You got to smile a lot. That's all you have to be for me. And you have to have some experience as we want to have some dental experience, but it's, it's all about just personality for me. Yeah. I, now, and if it's not working out better to get rid of them quick, quickly and just, and just move on. Well, I mean, that was my experience with those two people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it was the first person I ever fired. I remember she cried. They both cried when we, when we fired mm-hmm. them. Um, the second one, I actually kind of chickened out and I made my office manager do it, you know, because she was on the, fr- she was on the front end and I didn't really have much communication with her to begin with. So I it just didn't feel like I wanted to do that. So I, I pawned it off on her, but the first one was she was a dental assistant and, um, yeah, it's, you don't want to make anybody cry. I don't like making girls cry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that stinks, you know? So yeah. it was hard, but it's, yeah, we just couldn't, we were pouring so much energy into this person that just, um, sweet, very sweet personality, yeah. very sweet, just wasn't ever going to get it to mm-hmm. the standards that I wanted. She, my office was not the right office for her. So, yeah. Yeah, the first, I mean, the first step is that they actually show up for the interview. We, I can't <laughs> tell you how many people just never even showed up. You know, like, what, yeah. did they get the wrong day? Like, and yeah. it's just, you know, it's unbelievable. Well, this one I'm talking about, she showed up to the interview in, interview in like really short jean shorts. Yeah. So like we call their jean shorts, like when's jean shorts starting? Because I'm like, man, you know what? Like, like maybe she's got two kids. Maybe she just, just had to drop them off at practice or something. She didn't get a chance to go home and change. At least she showed up on time. Um, in retrospect, I think Jean George just really was clueless. Yeah. And that's yeah. what she decided to wear to the interview, but yeah. I gave her the benefit of the doubt and I probably shouldn't have. So, yeah, I, I actually, I wear Jean shorts to all my interviews. So, um, but, <laughs> I hope um, those are coming back in style, man. I, I miss the Jean shorts. They go with everything. Are, yeah. I just wear them at home, you know? Yeah. Um, Let me get some. so, um, we, we actually, so we had a, an assistant that, she was there for about a week or two. Um, there were some, you know, red flags. And then one day, you know, we're open on Saturdays. She came in on a Saturday, so hungover. She yeah. got so wasted the night before. Yeah. She said she was going to take a nap in one of the dental chairs. And she took a nap during lunch. And I couldn't wake her up. She was snoring and she was so passed out that we had, and she was snoring so loud that we had to move to the other end of the office to, um, I usually work in rooms one and two. I had to go down to rooms six and seven because I couldn't wake her up and she was snoring like an orchestra. So, Holy cow. Um, 
yeah so you know some people just you know slip through that did you just like tape a note to her chest and say when you wake up you're fired <laughs> no don't bother uh coming back um so yeah i mean having having a, a great team is is um is so important and turnover is such a killer i mean it's, yeah. it's not only is it exhausting but it's expensive um mm-hmm. to find someone new and train them so you find good people you know take good care of them and um you know make it people that you enjoy working with yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. let me add one more thing to that, Eric, is that, you know, the thing is, too, is that I've had team members upset where they have come to me. And they haven't come to me. I have asked them how things are going. And I have had team members tell me, you know what, I'm thinking about leaving, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, the one that comes to mind is like my one of my insurance or my insurance coordinator. She told me she was thinking about leaving four years ago now, you know, and the thing is, is when you're asking your team, you're on the pulse of what, how everyone's feeling man, all the things that she was upset about, I didn't know about them. I didn't know they were going on. I didn't know what was upsetting her. And those would have perpetuated and continued until she said, you know what, screw it. I'm fed up with this stuff. But I asked her and and she felt comfortable enough to tell me and I addressed them and now she's happy. So that's the thing is that why has no one left my team? Well, because I'm talking to them and, and I'm finding out what's upsetting them and I'm giving them, I say, man, Oh, everything's great. Everything's no, really. Tell me what's tell me what frustrates you the most. Oh, everything, I love everything here. Everything, nothing frustrates me. You got to give me one thing. I need one thing from you. Tell me what's what's the most frustrating thing. I don't care if it's that when you walk in, you got to step over somebody's shoes. You better come up with something. And they always come up with something. They go, well, and then they give you something that like you, you knew they were just holding back on it. They, yeah. You got to press because everyone's gets frustrated by something. And um so yeah, I just wanted to throw that little tidbit in there that if you if you talk to your team, you can find out about these things to avoid them leaving. Now, was this? Did you learn this? Um, did you have this early on in your career? Was this a learned behavior where the communication? Just learn, man. Just got, yeah. You know what's weird is that I learned it, and then I like read some books. And I'm like, that's what it is. That's what I do. Like I read a book about psychological safety, meaning that you make it safe for people. I'm like, that's what I do. Um, I read another really great book called, oh, it's it's called I Hear You. The it's something like incredibly simple art to extraordinary relationships. I don't know, but it's called I Hear You. And it's all about just like validating people's feelings. And I'm just like, holy cow, like, this is the secret sauce. This is what I do with everyone. Now, I don't know where the heck I learned that. If I learned that from my parents or, you know, my peer group and when I was growing up. Um, but I've always just been someone, I think my, my dad always taught me just kind of say it how it is, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and say it how it is, is I had an, I have an ex-sister-in-law that used to say it how it was. And she said, I, I just say it how it was. But she was, she shouldn't be saying what she was saying. Like, she, you got to have the emotional skill. You had the emotional skills to know when you can yeah. say the F word in public, I guess is a good analogy. But yeah. it's like, you got to, don't say it how it is all the time, but um, just speak clearly with people, communicate your ideas. Like, not everyone thinks like you and not everyone has the same perspective nor um, expectations. And that's what makes us human. But to work together, we have to talk. And you have to share and you have to get vulnerable and you have to respect other people's opinions. So I think that was all kind of just foundationally, just probably for my upbringing, but I took that into leadership and, but yeah, no, it was not something I learned. I mean, I mean, I learned it by trial and error, but uh, mm-hmm. it wasn't like I went to a course on how to do that. Now, what kind of advice can you give for, you know, like personally, I'm more introverted, mm-hmm. um, you know, cause what you said there, the not knowing what's going on is so common in dental offices, yeah. especially you're busy. Right. Um, if you're a high volume office, big off, big staff. Um, and you you seem like you're very kind of in touch with the communication with the staff, but what about someone that's working, you know, they just got out of school, they're $500,000 in debt. They're yeah. working six days a week and they just don't have the time. Yeah. Um, what do you recommend for them? Um, you know what, and this is going to be very counterintuitive, but I would say work less. I really strongly, so strongly believe in this, that if you, you can't, you will make more money working less if you put in the effort to doing these things. Now, how much do you have to do that? Let's say you're, you're solo doc at a practice. you you guys are open five days a week. I would say cut down to four days a week and take a full day of just working with your team instead Mm -hmm. of doing that now you really probably don't even have to do that honestly you could probably do like maybe two three hours a week where you just block out some time and you just bring people in your office and talk to them and you just walk around and you just talk to people and just get to know them more on a personal level too i mean relationship building is a big part of it as well is 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 a big part of that trust so i I think you can go further faster if you're doing those things but because yeah i mean like you mentioned turnover cost turnover is a time suck turn turnover costs money um 
I, I think you just, you, you have to now, as far as like someone who's introverted, uh, I think you can be introverted and still do this same thing. Like as much as I, people would tell you I'm very extroverted. I like to be by myself and I like to, I enjoy my alone time, you know? I, and I think sometimes going to the office and putting on a happy face all day long is, is exhausting, you know? So I, so I, I feel for that, but I think when you start to see the results and you start to see the engagement of your team, it, it, you'll, it'll feed on you. It's almost like when you start working out and you start seeing the results, you're like, all right, let's keep doing this. I can tell you just recently with my front desk team, we started, I just started noticing that I started talking to my front desk team, maybe 12 of them, maybe there's 12 of them. I have no idea how many there are. And I said, you know, who is, who's comfortable doing in-house financing? And I found there was like three of them comfortable doing it. I'm like, what the heck is this? So then I was like, you know what? We're gonna, sh- we're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna meet with half of you guys for an hour on Wednesday. <clears throat> we'll have the night team come in early, and then you guys can say an hour later, and then I'll meet with the other half. And we started, we did that for uh, maybe six weeks straight. And I can't tell you how different it felt at that front desk. They felt one appreciated. Mm -hmm. Uh, They felt, uh, I mean, you know, someone's giving them the tools to do their job better. They want, everyone wants to win. Everyone wants to do better. Um, We felt connected. The culture felt different. And immediately we started getting more five-star reviews. It was like, and now maybe that just is a chance. I don't know, but I don't think it was. I think it's when you work with your team, that culture changes. And when you talk to your team, that culture changes. People feel good when, when you invest the time in them. And, and I think so for new dentists. Yeah, I get it. You, you got to crank, man. But I always tell people September is a really bad month. I used to take no time off in September. Then I took one week off. We still did the same. I took two weeks off in September. We literally still do the exact same number. You can take the, all those holes in your schedule, cut back your time, and you can consolidate it. And I guarantee you will, you will actually probably make more when you cut down your days and to some certain extent. Now, if you're, you're busy straight on through, I mean, it, that doesn't make sense, but if you got holes in your schedule, you can consolidate that schedule and make a little bit of time for your team. And I think it will pay off more than any other course or CE class that you will take. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, more time for your team. So, you know, like you said, less clinical hours, I mean, clinically, you know, is exhausting when you're working yeah. eight hours a day and you're, you know, doing hygiene checks and, you know, you're, you're worried about, you got to keep that happy face on for your patients, for all the yeah. hygiene patients, totally exhausting. Yeah. Um, you know, especially, you know, for me as, as an introvert, you know, that, that social interaction was, was exhausting. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a, a, a sweatpants to scrub ratio. So uh-huh. I literally, my whole life now is I'm either in sweatpants or I'm in scrubs. Uh-huh. So I, I, I live seven minutes away from my office. So I, I drive to work in sweatpants and I change into scrubs and nice. then I put my sweatpants back on and, and I go home. Oh, that's so awesome. The, the less clinical hours, so less scrub time, you know, more um, time, um, you know, non-clinical time. Um, I just find that I'm happier, you know, just in general, oh, yeah. you know, taking that, that, that time off. Um, and that's really the name of the game. You want to enjoy going to work and you can't run yourself ragged, um, you know, for, for 30 years, it's just, you're just never going to be able to do it. And that's, yeah. I think when people get burned out, um, so decreasing your clinical hours, finding some other interests, um, is such a great stress relief, um, from the, the stresses of the profession. Um, so I want to wrap this baby up with mm-hmm. something I heard on one of your other podcasts. Um, cause I have, there's a couple of life coaches on my website. Yeah. Um, and I'm one of the major, um, and I know therapy is totally different than a life coach Mm -hmm. where therapy is more about, um, learning about your past and what makes you tick in your childhood and why you are the way you are. Whereas a life coach is more about setting goals and moving forward. Mm -hmm. Um, but therapy was, was such an important, you know, part of me enjoying, you know, avoiding burnout and enjoying going to work every day. Me as well. Tell me about your, your experience with a life coach. So, so I've done life coaching and I've done therapy. I've done uh, therapy twice for two periods of my life, one of which was maybe 2014. And, and just, I mean, this year was, it was cause like this, uh, this is my year. This was, I did so much personal growth this year. Um, and it's because of the therapy and the life coach, but yeah, life coach, uh, they just help you work through like, so like, and I talked about this on my podcast, my life coach asked me, said, how much joy do you spend in your working week? What percentage is it things that are joyful for you? 
I said, I don't know, like maybe like 20, 25%. And she's just like, well, why do you do all those other 75% of stuff? And I'm like, I don't know. And then like, well, well, what do you do that doesn't bring you joy? Okay, let's talk about it. Let's dissect it. And if I told you, if I told you like the conversations we have, like this was my problem and this was the solution we came up with, you'd be like, yeah, no crap, man. That's the logical sense. But I'm telling you, you can't, you just can't arrive at those conclusions on your own because you got all these like emotional tie-ins to all these things like like these these stories that we tell ourselves like dude I, I could never go down to one and a half days a week clinical because my team would never let me and they, and, and then like we, we dissect this issue and it could really it's just two team members I'm talking about that I'm, I'm worried that would they would be upset if I cut my clinical time more and then and then I'm just sure of it I'm so sure of it and then she's like well did you ever ask them I'm like no I should just freaking ask them, you know, and, and I'm telling you, like, it's just things like that. It's so simple, but it's not, but then it's also like getting like really clear on like, what do you want more of um, not beating yourself too much over what, what you think you should have or should want or what, how you think you should behave and just planning out the things that like you really love doing and just doing more of them and figuring out a way for it to work within your life. It, it, it's, it's funny. I, it's very hard to describe life coaching, but I, I cannot tell you, I, I think it is the best thing I've ever done in my whole entire life was, was working with my life coach. And um, yeah, like, like listeners, you guys want to, I, I'd be happy to refer them to the person I use. If anyone wants to send me that email, um, I, I'll do that. But yeah, uh, life coach is great. It's, it's hard to describe, but dude, what, what, what do you have to lose? You know, like try it, try it for three months. If it ain't working, stop doing it. That's why I tell people that everyone's always scared to cut down clinical days. Well, guess what? Worst case scenario, it doesn't work out. You just add that day back. Big deal. You know, but we make these big, uh, these make these big problems, problems bigger than they are. So it's, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's about it. I'll stop there. Now, do you wish that you had um, uh, gotten in touch with a life coach much earlier on in your yes. career? Yes, absolutely. I, I think the amount of growth I've done this year is, um, it's the same thing with my expansion. Once you know what you know, it's so much easier to go forward faster. When we went from five to 11 ops, we maxed that place out quick. It took so much longer to max out that five op. And that's just because I didn't really exactly understand what I was doing or, or didn't know what to focus on. And I think I was putting my energy in the wrong places. Um, now with, with the life coach is, is really changed the way. And I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm still working on a lot of stuff. Man. I'm never going to be perfect. Always just becoming better. Cause we, we always go back to our defaults, you know, as, as you know, everyone has their default, but yeah, to have somebody really make you spend that mental energy on what do I want? What do I enjoy? What do I love and how to get more of it? That's a, it's a nice thing to say that one day I'm going to sit down, I'm going to do this when, when I would say most of us don't even sit down for an hour a year and write goals. So yeah, it's it's helpful in that regard. And, and as you know, Eric, the people that write down goals, man, they you get your goals. You just mm -hmm. got to sit there and think about what it is you want. So, I think if if at bare minimum, it's helpful for that regard. Yeah, I was going to ask you about goals, and you know, mine is of course, you know, more sweatpants, less scrub. So that's one of my goals. So um, <laughs> you got to get that printed on like a wall somewhere. So I know. Like, I, gotta get, I, I love. I that. smell. I smell t-shirt. Um, yeah, right. So, um, yeah, so let's, you know, thanks so much for joining us again, Dr. Paul Etchison. Um, what you, are you working on a second book? Did you say, and what's that? Yeah, all about? I got a second book. It's going to be dental practice hero too. Um, and it's, it's, it's more focused on kind of what we talked about today that we're, we're, I, I really think it's just so beneficial. Um, when I wrote the first one, I had just taken out on associate and having had an associate for five years now. I, I've realized that the practice grows, runs much better, and your life is much more fulfilling, less stress when you have the time to um, cut your clinical days and, and, and work more. Now, um, I've, I know I've, t I've coaching clients that have cut clinical days without an associate. So I'm not saying you have to have an associate. I think life is better with associate. We're not mm -hmm. so alone. It's fun to take time off from the practice and not see it as an opportunity cost rather than, um, you know, like, yeah, this vacation costs 5,000, but it really costs, you know, 20,000 because I shut down the office. Mm -hmm. it, it's nice to not think about that. But the, yeah, my new book's about going down to three days a week. It's just primarily focused on that, the systems you need to do that. And that will be out as soon as I get off my lazy butt and <laughs> finish editing it. You know, what's funny is that you said, Eric, is that my, 
my first book came out in 2017. One of my biggest regrets is releasing my book on New Year's Eve of 2017 because it immediately makes it seem older than it is. I should have waited one. Yeah, it was like literally released on like January 30th of or yeah, or whatever, 31st. And it was just such a, it was just such a brain fart. Like now it's a 2017 book. It really came out at the beginning of 2018. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you lost a whole year. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. No kidding. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much, Paul. I, you know, I read your first, first book, so I look forward to reading your second book uh, when Thank that you. comes out, but, uh, but let's be in touch. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. I had a good time. All right. Great. Yeah. Be in touch. Take care. Cool.